So here is a summary, and it might start way too technical because I mentioned Yajima's LP theory. Rest assured, I will explain what that is, but <laughs> we'll, we'll recall what the wave operators are. They go back a long time to the beginning of quantum mechanics. We'll talk about the resolvent identity. It's dual Fourier dual, the Duhamel expansion. Then we'll write the wave operator as some kind of infinite series. The issue here is really the summability or lack thereof as far as the series is concerned, when each term is large. Then we'll discuss, um, this is my collaborator, former student, Marius Becciano. Becciano introduced, quite amazingly, I think, into this very old subject, a new tool, which is Venus. Very old lemma, goes back about the same time as quantum mechanics itself hadn't been used in the context of spectral theory before, but it turns out that an operator valued Wiener algebra inversion theorem, which is really a, a tool for summation. It allows you to um, sum divergent series. And then in the context of so-called structure theorems for Stein, uh, sorry, for wave operators, I will try and indicate how to use this. I warn you, that's the most technical part, and um, that's not so easy to, to present. And there are several open problems here. So let's, here they are. These are the wave operators. So perhaps for this audience, it's ridiculous for me to try and motivate this, but I'll spend two minutes doing just that. If you go back to Newton's equations, and you give yourself initial position um, x naught and initial velocity xi naught, then you just get straight linear motion. Um, sorry, this is for v equals 0. So you turn this off, then you turn it back on. So you have two different trajectories. You have x of t, um, comma x naught, xi naught. This is the free trajectory. And then you have um, x tilde of t, say y naught, eta naught, which is v naught 0. That's this. All right? So you have, when v is 0, you get straight linear motion. When v is present, you can have complicated behavior. In particular, you might have trap trajectories, trajectory that either in forward, backward, or both time directions remain bounded for all times. We're not interested in those. We're interested in the ones where the perturbed, the nonlinear non motion can be approximated by linear. So what you are after is you want to compare not just as sets, but as actual functions in time. So you would want to, and I'll suppress now these. So you want to be able to say when this and its time derivative tends to 0 as t tends to infinity. And to say this in a more sensible fashion, you can ask if I give you x0 psi 0, that's no potential, free vacuum. Can you then find y0, eta 0 for your choice of potential so that this will hold and vice versa? The former is existence of wave operators. The latter is so-called asymptotic completeness. In quantum mechanics, these trajectories become the time-dependent Schrodinger evolution. So to be consistent with my notation, maybe I should put a tilde there and a 0. And h0 would be minus Laplacian. And then instead of these, these are Euclidean lengths of vectors in R3. This would now be, say, L2. You ask if you give me psi 0, can I then find this so that this will tend to 0 as time tends to infinity? And you have a choice of plus or minus infinity. And because this is unitary, you can put it over here. It becomes e to the minus i th, and to some extent, you've computed what you're after. You have computed this. If it exists, it has to be this strong limit. They will never converge in the operator norm because they're unitary by themselves. So therefore, 
we have now the question, we have understood that the main question to address at this um, basic level here is whether these strong limits exist. So you stick in a function, you simply write this as an integral of its own time derivative. That time derivative is h minus h naught. You get the potential. And then you ask for the strongest possible sense in which this could converge. And that is in the absolute sense, <laughs> when you pass the norms inside. So ignoring possible cancellations in time. Then you use that this is unitary. You pull out the autonom of V, you're left with this L infinity norm. You might object because this L infinity norm need not be finite if F is in L2. But we take F in L1 intersect L2, which is dense here. Then you have pointwise decay, only large time times matter. So don't worry about time 0. That gives you just integral 0 to 1. That does nothing. So you see that when the dimension is 3 or higher, this thing is finite, as you desired. And now why can you pass back to L2? We're not content with L1 intersect L2. Well, by density, we can conclude that that limit exists for all f in L2 simply because for fixed times, these are unitary operators. So this exists in the strong sense. And the argument I gave is not doesn't give you the best possible condition for V. These types of considerations, as Tom, all of you can confirm, go back many decades. All right? So by now, there is Cato smoothing theory. By now, I mean, it goes back to the 60s. So what properties do these intertwining wave operators have? So you see, they have an, it's very intuitive how they should behave, because roughly speaking, the wave operator is for large time. So if you take a function, then for large time, t large here, right? then if you act from the left with e to the i is h, then that should be. A S comes through. So you will get here W e to the i s h naught, right? It just passes right through, but it comes out as an h naught, not a, as an h. So therefore, because these the Fourier transform is what it is, this family of operators is rich enough to represent everything. Therefore, you have this. So instead of e to the i something, you can take any function defined by the functional calculus. And then you use that for isometries, w, w star is the proje orthogonal projection onto the range. You have a representation for something that's difficult, namely function of an operator in terms of the conjugation by isometries of a much easier object, function of the free Laplacian. And easy to see that that range is orthogonal to the pure point subspace, asymptotic completeness means much more that the range is actually the AC subspace and that singular continuous subspace is trivial. The resolvent identity, which we all know, um, R0 here is the free resolvent based on H0. And HR is defined by this, all right? So you can go on infinitely here, provided V is not large, V is small. If v is not small, you have the standard problem that you somehow either have to truncate this or you have a so-called error term. So a convenient form to address this is to use the symmetric version where you split v into two halves, basically, as explained here. All right. So now, yeah. That's the symmetric. Free resolvent on either end, yeah. and the Biermann Schwinger sits inside. What's the u though? The u is the, so v is square root squared, basically. So v absolute v1 half, signum v absolute v1 half, and u is this bit. U is unitary. Yeah, but, but this is. Uh, v is real, so. But this is not, not, this is not an identity. It is. Where's the, where's the, uh, oh, oh, I see. I here, here the hard see. part, the hard yeah, part yeah, is this. So you, you shift the problem. You shift the problem from inverting this to inverting identity plus something with the obvious um, kind of 
advantage here that in many cases this is compact, so you yeah. then have fret home. Okay, that's the reason. Okay, yeah. That's yeah. the reason you do this. So I will skip over. There would be much to say about even the L2 theory of the wave operators, but I'll skip right to the LP theory. And in the 1990s, Kenji Yajima, who at some point was in Princeton, maybe you rim, you know this well, um, he proved that the wave operators are bounded from LP, at least if the dimension is greater or equal 3. And you have to assume something important. You have to assume that zero energy is regular, neither an eigenvalue nor resonance. So what this means is you can you can see this from here. Oh, this is n-body theory. Ah. The, they did asymptotic completeness for n-body. Um, so what zero energy resonance or eigenvalue means is the following: the classical theory, which which I call, many people call perhaps, agmon kato koroda theorem. Right? agmon kato koroda theorem says that if V decays at least like x to the minus 1 minus epsilon, so faster than inverse x power, then the wave operators exist and are complete. You have asymptotic completeness. You have a distorted Fourier transform. You have, you're in a good position. That's the short range. So. Amongst other things, you have to then prove that this inverse is well defined in a suitable sense. So here, the way the advantage of doing the symmetric form is then this becomes L2 bounded if V is decays faster than inverse first power. But at zero energy, this may or may not exist. Okay? So the classical theory says that this exists for all non-zero lambda. For zero lambda, it may or may not exist. You have to always make this an assumption. Um, and that is not for the existence of the wave operators, wave operators but for um, any kind of LP, P different from 2. There it matters hugely. And so he proved that if zero energy is well behaved in the sense that we just discussed, and if V decays in three dimensions like that, then the wave operators are bounded. In higher dimensions, you need more conditions. Dimension 5, you also need a derivative, like a first derivative of the potential. And, and it's false if those conditions are, are... Ah, that's a delicate thing. So we'll have more to say about that. Yeah. So but definitely, this is sharp. If zero energy fails to be well behaved, so if you either have a zero energy resonance, which means that h psi is zero, has a solution, which is not L2, but it decays like 1 over x in three dimensions. Okay? That's a resonance function. Then you destroy the boundedness of the wave operators. They are simply not bounded anymore all the way from 1 to infinity. You get this much smaller range. Okay? And why could you guess that this is destroyed, that you cannot have boundedness at 1 and infinity if zero energy is not regular, if the Biermann Schwing operator is not invertible at zero energy? Well. That's because of this intertwining property. If you had LP bounds, then because of this, you could transfer any kind of pointwise decay from here to there. So you would have the t minus 3 halves decay in three dimensions for the Schrodinger operator with a potential, provided you project away from the bound states. And this was also known since the 70s to fail if zero energy is ill-behaved. Rauch and others, I think in, in the Russian literature this was also observed, Weinberg, um, you lose a full power of t. You would only have t minus a half. So this indicates, uh, proves that this is, has to be false if zero energy is not regular. Interestingly enough, in dimension 1 and 2, this is also incorrect. You lose these endpoints because of a single integral that pops up in dimension 1 and 2. Yeah, that's actually not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not. So this is a bit of a delicate business. And so what did Yajima do? He went back to, I think, he was a student of Kuroda, but Kuroda was a student of Kato. So in some sense, this all goes back to Toshio Kato. He had this time-independent representation of the wave operators, but 
this might be a mysterious thing of me to say because we have time here, but you'll see in a moment that you can get rid of the time. You can integrate it out and you get resolvance. So formally speaking, we can take the representation that we had on the first slide where you write W, remember, as the identity plus an integral from zero infinity, you iterate this. If you iterate it, you get an infinite series um, and you get these two Hamel time integrals which don't involve the unknown evolution, the evolution involving a potential, only the free shirting evolutions and the potential is sandwiched in between those. And to indicate that this is not just a formal expansion, at least if V is small, this series converges properly in a rigorous sense. You can use something, ignore the details, called kill tau endpoint. This might be Terry Tau's most cited paper, okay? This kill tau endpoint. Um, and if you use that, you see that under an L3 halves condition, ignore these second exponents. These are Lorentz space refinements of the standard Lebesgue spaces. They are of some importance, but it's too detailed for to pay attention to this now. So L3 halves condition is extremely natural in this whole game. And let me explain why, because... Um, so this Duhamel thing, is, is that what the Dyson series is? Yeah, <laughs> this is a Dyson series, and the Dyson series converges in 3D, and you can write down conditions for other dimensions, if the L3 halves norm of the potential is small. So what is special about L3 halves? That has to do with... This is the so-called critical norm for the Schrodinger problem, because if you look at how this scales, so if h, so what type of potential would scale exactly like the Laplacian? If you think like a physicist, this has 1 over meter squared units. So you want 1 over meter squared units here. So that means that the critical case is x minus 2 decay. That's when these two strike a balance. And corresponding to this is exactly L3 halves, because this is this is in weak L3 halves, in L3 halves comma infinity. And, and the sharpness has to do with 3 halves, right? That's, that's the critical case. So that's the, that's the, that's the, that was the first time I heard about, about, about Terry Tau. Uh, yes, yes. About, uh, yeah. All right, so 3 halves, uh, there is, really this is a natural norm, and it's good. it has to occur in this context. Because whatever smallness you have, this condition has to be, sorry, this condition had better be scaling invariant. So if you subject V to the scaling that's natural to this problem, which is lambda minus 2 V of lambda inverse x, call this V lambda of x, whatever condition you formulate that guarantees the convergence of the Dyson series, it had better be invariant under this scaling. Otherwise, you could artificially make the potential small. And magic, right? So it doesn't exist. So, so you, must make, you must make it much less than one. For this, yeah, I mean, you can be precise. So is, it, is, it, is it actually false that it's less than one, or is, it, is that? Ah, uh, we'll define it. What is it? Okay, what so the series. Yeah, so the series then fails to converge in a normal it does sense. Fail does fail to converge. But Becciano and I, in the theorem I'm about to state, yeah. we had to find a way around precisely that. This issue. Issue. So we. We use the Wiener algebra method to sum the divergent but size. When you say converge, you mean actually norm conversion. Norm conversion. Yeah. Norm so do you have a way of getting a norm convergence? No, no. no, we have a way of circumventing. So we cannot do the infinite okay. expansion. Okay. You have to, we'll get to that. Yeah, so sorry. please be patient. Small, uh, my question was when it's small enough, it's norm conversion. It is uh, in strong in the, in the L2 sense, in the L2. And the reason for this you see here, because there is an L2 here. Yeah, okay. yeah. So now I'll get a little bit technical, and uh, I'll give you a heads up what's happening next. Next, we pass Fourier transform onto this. You get e to the i t minus s absolute psi squared, yeah. right? Yeah. And you do this everywhere. If you do this everywhere, this becomes multiplication, becomes a convolution. So on the next slide, you will see just don't complain, don't kill me for these formulas, it just naturally pops up, all right? Okay. So here they are, okay? <laughs> Nothing to be afraid of. Well, wait a yeah. Uh, I don't, rec I don't recognize so the denominator, I'm sorry. 
you do. You, you do recognize them because look here. Are you going to you, integrate them up? You integrate out, for example, the S1. So okay. then you will get xi from here squared minus the xi from there squared in the denominator. Okay. And the reason you see epsilon because you put in the usual conversion factors. So you say e to the i minus epsilon t minus s1. But wouldn't that be like doing a resolver expansion? Yes, it's all dual because Duhamel yeah. is dual to yeah. Dyson. Yeah. All right, so up to a Fourier transform, which we now perform, these are dual things to each other. Mm -hmm. So you get this. You get these small divisors, these singular denominators, which are natural to the subject. Right? Yeah. And I didn't want to have too many slides, but I have other talks on this where I start discussing the stein thomas restriction theorem, which actually plays a role in the background, kind of, in the main theorem of Bechiano and mine. But to keep the technique kind of limited, I'm skipping that in this talk. Uh, but your, your plan is to introduce this smoothing factor epsilon and then make uniform epsilon. You make everything uniform in epsilon. So the first term is manageable, right? You have a single potential. You get this um, denominator. Then it's natural to pass to the kernel version of this. Get rid of the Fourier transform. What's a little bit surprising is maybe that we write x minus y, not x comma y. There is a reason for that. It's a convenient thing to do. Yeah, yeah like because you can, cha you can chain these estimates then more easily. Now I just ask you to either do these calculations in your heads or just believe me that if you carry out this integration, at the end of the day, you get a neat formula for this kernel K1. Um, it has this structure. And V has to be somewhere. So V is hiding in this L. What you end up doing is you pick a direction that Z hat is a unit vector. That's, I think, physics notation to put hats over unit vectors. You pick a direction, you restrict the Fourier transform to minus that, so that's a half line. And then you undo the Fourier transform along that line, and this s comes from three dimensions. In dimensions other than three, you would not have oh, this okay. s. I have a, I have a question. Yeah. Th where's the omega on the right hand side? Sorry, the omega is a z hat, that's a typo. Okay. Sorry, so sorry. That's a z hat. My, my apologies. And wait a minute. So then I, I, I gotta, I'm trying to absorb this, uh, this K1 here for a second, because obviously it's going to play a big role. Uh, am I correct? Yes, yes, yes. yes. So, so you, this, this structure is very important. You have absolute z minus this scalar. The scalar is the projection, twice the projection of x onto direction z hat. So you have, so you have scalar, then the, the, z, the z hat is a unit vector. Uh, it's just a unit vector. It's the, the direction of z. Oh, okay, okay. No, uh, yeah. okay. And so you scale that factor out. Here's the length. And inside, you only you could also choose to have so z. That L is really, it's, it's really like a, it's just a modified Fourier transform with potential, isn't it? It's related to the Radon transform. What is the Radon transform? So if you have the true Radon transform, then the f Fourier transform of the Radon transform is related to the full Radon, a uh, full Fourier transform by such an expression, but you go from minus infinity to infinity, not from zero to infinity. So this is a little bit different. It's like a Hilbert transform on top of a Radon transform. All right, we haven't been able to use these observations in any meaningful way. We just have this formalism. All right. Ah, because you have an s squared. It has to do with this denominator. You would have an s squared ds, but you lose one power of s because of this. You linearize. You see, this eta squared goes out. It's very important to have a quadratic term here. If we had the wave equation, like in Lax Phillips, I wouldn't know what to do at this point. I need, I need this quadratic form. That's simply what this simple calculation gives you. Okay. And now let's go on and see what do we do with this. 
The upshot is that this very W1, this is the, remember, that's the first term in the formal expansion, or not formal if the potential is small of the wave operator. It's this here. This is trivial. The so then it turns out that this, if you plug everything in, right, this function L, you plug it in. Remember, we had x minus y. So omega now replaces z hat. It truly became an omega on the unit sphere. Oh, yeah, because of course the z yeah. hat is, a, is an angular variable. Yeah. So notice that we had an absolute z squared here. You use three dimensions because instead of r squared dr, you just have dr. It canceled. This is all of these small things are important. Yeah. So our calculations are so far really in 3D. We are working on other D, but the progress is slow. So if you plug this all in, you find something quite interesting. So s omega is this reflection. It's the reflection of x about the plane perpendicular to omega. Because we had this here, you change variables, and you end up with the following thing. You end up that w1 is a superposition of reflections and translations. Where's epsilon go? Epsilon, we got rid of it. We passed to the limit. Oh, you have? I passed to the limit. Okay. Um, uh, here, epsilon is still present. Okay, then, then I set it equal to 0. I get cleaner. Okay. It's clean. So you see that my w1 acts on an input by a superposition of translations Rotation. and reflections. Ref these s omega are the reflection about the hyperplane. Yeah. And so yeah, this so sits here. Yeah, but you're, yeah, you're and then is a then stuff. is a translation. And what is this weight g1 x dy? Well, it's what this expression v sits here says. So if you just peel this off g1 x dy, it's a measure in y. It's a measure living house to h1 is house of one measure. It's a measure living on a line. By this indicator, it's restricted to a half space. So you get a half line. And the weight on the line is given by this, by this L function that we just had. Peter will object to it's use of seven, yeah. L function, <laughs> L function. <laughs> this ain't an L function. Um, all right. <laughs> so you have this G1. And remember what Yajima wants. He wants to understand the boundedness properties of W, the full wave operator. Well, at the moment, we're just content with the first non-trivial term in the expansion. So if you pass, for example, an LP norm in here, you put absolute values there. You put this in L infinity. You um, you use Minkowski's inequality, so s omega reflections and translations are isometries. So you just get the alpinum of this back. Then what you're left to do is you have to pay um, the total variation of the measure in dy, and then the L1 norm in omega. That's that. So what we've just proved is that the p operator norm of the first term is bounded by this norm of L, which is defined here, it's L1 in R omega times, it's, uh, I said the operator norm, so F is gone. So, so if we go back, so a couple of slides for a second. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so you have this huge series. Is it just going to be, is it just going to be a, a, a product, operator product of the Yeah, of the case? so the story of this is that Yajima, he observed something like this. His his papers are not easy to read. And um, that's not his fault, necessarily. What he did is he observed this for the first term. And then what you just indicated, he obtained a similar structure for all of these. But then he was left, because he did a finite expansion of the Born series and not an infinite one, he couldn't do it. His potential is large. He's left with a remainder term. And that remainder term contains the perturbed resolvent. So he had to play some tricks. He didn't have a structure like this superposition of translations and reflections for that. And that was also a source of losses for him in terms of assumptions on the potential, because you just have to do something perhaps artificial with the term that contains the perturbed resolvent. You're left with bounds on the perturbed resolvent. And it, it's a, a non-optimal procedure in that regard. So what Becciano and I tried is to avoid um, 
hitting this head on and rather we exploited this fairly explicit or completely explicit structure of W1 and we played some algebra games where you start writing, you find a suitable algebra of operators. Uh, you're going to take yeah, one plus that. Yeah. Yes. So far you've just explained W1. Yes. So now, now you got to go 1 plus W1 and invert or something like that. You'll see. OK. So let me not, I'll come back to that. Let me just say the theorem. So V in B1 plus, well, that was the previous slide. Ignore that. So there exists some space that holds V. OK, it's called B1 plus. And it's not the optimal one. The optimal one would be x minus 2. Roughly speaking, b1 plus means you lose a half here and then an epsilon. So it's minus 5 half minus epsilon. That's what it is, OK? And zero energy has to be regular, meaning neither an eigenvalue nor resonance. And then the full wave operator, this is not w1. The plus refers to the time direction. You have a w minus 2. And then the full wave operator has the same property. Uh, it uh, just remind me, in these problems, the point spectrum is below the continuum. Yes, yes. So you have as you can have is this resonance at the yes. bottom. Yes. So under this assumption, it's known that you can only have finitely many yeah. bound states. Um, zero, you cannot yeah, say. Re it, it may or may not may be. be and you have asymptotic completeness, meaning you only have AC spectrum. Right. And and so just like we had for W1, you have this structure, superposition of translations and, sorry, translations and reflections, yes. You have that for the full creature. And G, yeah. and G, note how we needed this precise norm. We had to have uniform in X and then measure L1 in the other variables. There, yes, there was a measure, not L1, because you sat on a line. All right. But so it's almost the same. I like we do it first order perturbation theory, except you got a new G. You have a new G, but we no longer can say as cleanly what G is. It doesn't have to live on a line, because to some extent you get G by an infinite yeah. process. You have to get G by some infinite process, but that infinite it will have some of the same structure. It will be the a very well, complicated the superposition, so it will no longer live on a line. It might even have a continuum of directions. Yeah should have a continuum. So is it when you go back to the theorem, when you got the, G, the key equation, W plus F is F plus... Identity G. plus superposition of yeah, reflections. This is G, so it's like the yeah, uh, spread home with the... Yeah. Okay. Uh, so like G is the kernel. Yeah, okay. G is the kernel. Right. And it is a measure in this variable. It's L1 in that. And, and you have to do first this, then that, then that. All right? And... This, of course, doesn't please an analyst. What does less than infinity mean? So in other words, you want a bound. So how, what controls this? And the next slide will show you that this is really a nonlinear problem. Even though we started with a linear Schrodinger, look at what you have. You have nonlinear bounds. Exactly. Can we go back to that? Uh, just a second. Slide. Yeah. So, so you're saying that but maybe, it, I don't know whether this is a general fact, uh, uh, structurally, that the wave operators are, are expressed as a Identity. superposition. Superposition, yes. Of reflections. And translations. And translations. Yes. That's what that says. That's what that is. All it but is. But, but is that true in general? W define in general. Well, well let's, say, let's, say, let's say when I have a, when I have a wave operator, just that it, it exists. In, in dimension. Ah, okay. So, Maybe first of all, okay. <laughs> Few remarks. So, first of all, you agree that um, the use of this has to do with boundedness properties on on non L two, yeah. which implies the following thing: Can we get rid of various assumptions here? Can we get rid of zero energy being regular? No, you, can't do that. you cannot do that. Yeah. So, this theorem fails if so zero energy is. It would imply much too much. Similarly, you can't have this in two and one dimension because the wave operators, they are not bounded on L1. There are some Hilbert single integral appears. Nothing wrong with four dimensions. Ah, so we are working on higher dimensions. <laughs> okay, it looks like we can do it, but we also have to write it down. Okay. 
But so, so, so getting a bound of this W plus, uh, what's the final statement? So if you have some abstract bound of space, which is invariant under multiplication by indicators of half spaces, you can restrict to half spaces, and so that it's invariant under reflections and translations, then W plus is automatically bounded so on the... In higher dimension, I mean, the, what's very interesting is this role played by reflections. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there could be more general orthogonal transformations in height. I mean, is the reflection, I mean, they generate, of course, we They, have yes, if you, you can always write in dimension n, write n plus one reflections, yeah, right. give you every yeah. Euclid rigid yeah. motion and the yeah. translation. So. We still think that in, in higher odd, at least, you will have such a statement, right? Even is always more tricky because, right, the, resol the resolvent of the Laplacian in odd dimensions, its Riemann surface is that of the root. In even dimensions, for some reason, it's the logarithm, yeah. Riemann surface of the logarithm. So you have a different uniformization. Um, so again, coming back to the nonlinear nature of this, Gamma is the excess by which you fail to be B1. B1, again, would mean x minus 2 minus a half, which I think is 5 halves, right? Um, so you have this little excess. And then in terms of the size of the potential, we pay this much. But that can't be the whole story, because you have to quantify what it means that zero energy is regular. Yeah. And that's a place where our estimate is not effective if it's, it's this M0. Notice that we don't just impose a condition on zero energy. We introduce a number that keeps track of all energies. What we show in the paper is that if zero energy is neither eigenvalue nor resonance, then this is finite. Using a Fredholm alternative argument for non-zero energies. Because if this were failed to be invertible, then there would have to be embedded resonance, and that would have to be an embedded eigenvalue. And then there is work that's not all. There is UNESCO and David Jerison, when UNESCO was a postdoc at MIT, they proved that under some LP condition on the potential, there are no embedded eigenvalues. And then Koch et al. followed this up, and UNESCO and I redid agmon kato Kuroda theory in the context of the stein Thomas restriction theorem. All of this enters into that. I just ignore it here. So our estimate is not effective in the sense that. So, so you need all that structure to get to prove that this thing is bounded. All this stuff about Stein Thomas yeah, I just mentioned, we need that to prove that it's bounded. In the context of uh, our so whole. Zero. In the context of our spaces, one could argue that if we use completely different spaces, that we might be able to use the 60s and 70s theory. The all right, non-restriction, but I doubt that. So I don't know if it's feasible no, no, my, to. My question was back in three dimensions. You said you couldn't handle uh, uh, x to the minus two. You needed something. We need ha we lose half a power plus epsilon. Uh, but now, do you think that that is a, a fundamental? Problem? Ah, that's an ex that's a very delicate thing, and I have two slides in the end that talk about that. Okay, the the short answer to your question is we do not yet have a scaling invariant theory. Our structure, we have a scaling invariant condition, but then the potential has to be small. And it's a much more complicated condition than x minus 2. Much more complicated, unfortunately. So, so can you, so, all right, maybe, maybe, maybe you already said it, maybe you're going to say it. <laughs> so so how, how does this improve upon Yajima? Then? Ah, so Yajima had minus 5 minus epsilon. So we have minus 2 minus a half. So we improve by what? Well, Something. Two and a half. <laughs> well, you, so you definitely improve. It's my level. <laughs> and and, and th does Yajima require smallness or not? No, no, no. Large, know. large. He, but he does expand the Born series a number of times. Depending on the dimension, he expands it to 10 terms plus the remainder. And there is a reason he takes. It sounds strange, right? Why does he expand it 10 times and then? Well, because your remainder then is controllable. Actually. Yes, because he then has it sandwiched between yeah. other terms, and these are regularizing, and he can play some games. But yeah, that, that is a fairly contrived story, yeah. OK? And it's, it's prone to losses, and that's where he does occur the losses. We, he has the same one half loss for the first few terms that we have, but then we don't have losses for the remainder because we treat the remainder completely differently. Did he have this G? I couldn't, I didn't understand. 
He only had such a G for the first term. For the first term. Yeah. He had it for W1, he but he, he didn't pay, he didn't isolate it. Okay. He just wanted LP bounds. Okay. And so for the all but finitely many terms, he didn't have the G because all he cared was LP bounds. All right. So here is the quantitative version of this. You have, of course, a quantifiable, or rather a quantified expression of the invertibility of the Spearman-Schwinger operator and the size of the potential. All right. All right, so again, for the experts, I apologize to be recalling um, something as basic as that, but maybe it's interesting to see this very quickly. The classical Wiener theorem talks about and the reason you have this delta, you have the Wiener algebra L1, you augment it by the delta. On the circle, you don't have to do that. Yeah, so the, the, the cleanest way is to do it on the circle. <laughs> so, so suppose you have um, F in L1 of the circle. And now you want to solve F convolved with G is delta. Yeah. I mean, this girl find kind of cute. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But we don't use the maximal ideals here. Okay. We go back to the old-fashioned theory. Good for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all, the, all these fancy theories always throw some information away. And then you now, what's delta? Delta is just direct. So when can you That's solve, right. when can you invert? f in the L1 algebra. Okay. Okay. And there is a dual, dual formulation, which I can also recall. But let's do it in this way. The, a minimal condition is that f hat is not 0. Sure. And this is a continuous function, right? And Wiener made this brilliant observation that that is sufficient. The dual formulation of this would be to take um, f in the so-called Wiener algebra which are continuous functions for which this is summable. So, uh, All right. of course, I learned this in South Africa from a guy who is showing how the great Gelfand's theory is. Ah, OK. <laughs> that went the, from the opposite direction, yeah. <laughs> so on the, circ on the line on Euclidean space, you cannot write it like this, because the Fourier transform goes to 0 at infinity. Yeah. But the way out is you do it like that, which is very nice because you can immediately solve this if norm f is less than 1 by writing down the infinite series of convolutions. So you would, right? And Wiener theorem says that you don't have to be small L1 norm less than 1. It's just enough to have this not 0. So right? the statement is, OK, then the function you give me you give me f. I check that one plus f hat is not zero. It yes. might. Then there's a g. Then there's a g. Then I can assure you that there is a g in L one, and I will show you next how to construct it, so that. And that's this basically the, that's basically you're telling me that's basically the your genus series more or less. This smells like a similar thing because if you have a Dyson series with large terms, yeah. what if you find a way? And of course that's the hard part, to find a way to interpret it in such a way that you're left with checking, but on the operator level, something like that. And you see, to give part of the story away, this will be a Wiener condition. This will be the Fourier transform of some identity in some big space, okay, of the Fourier transform of an operator, okay, albeit for... We don't talk about maximal ideal spaces. Maybe we should. That's the next thing to look <laughs> at. OK? <laughs> but we do find a rather horrible algebra. And I'll show you okay, what it looks I'm like. I'm watching. That sounds getting interesting. A horrible algebra in which such a condition becomes okay. the invertibility, the, the, Wiener the Wiener condition, where you avoid having to sum an infinite series. Instead, you prove a Wiener theorem in a complicated algebra. Wait a minute. In the, the 
we answer there wasn't any infinite series, or maybe there is. There is, because look, proof. look, look. Maybe, uh, no, in the proof, which I will show you next, but my, I'm not doing well on time. You avoid that, but let me show you how you would do it with the series. So you write, look, you write delta 0 plus f inverse of delta 0 minus f plus f convolved with f. All right? Sure. And this converges in the L1 norm. Absolutely. So in a binary okay. algebra setting, if the norm of an operator is less than 1, then you can 1 plus k is invertible. Yeah. But 1 plus k can be invertible without an Yes, 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 yes. There is a spectrum. There is a maximal ideal. Yeah. There is a notion of a spectrum which has little to do with this right. spectrum in a Wiener algebra of a, an element. Yeah, but we don't use that. So what you're saying is you're showing how to invert this operator without doing the Dyson series. Yes, and the way you do this is divide and conquer. <laughs> All right. One thing you can never do is you can never work on the level of L infinity or continuous functions like here. You always have to work on the level of L1. Yep. Yeah. You can control L infinity by L1, but not the other way around. Nevertheless, it's extremely um, intuitive and instructive to think first in terms of L infinity and then see how to implement that on the level of L1. So here, um, you see these series. So maybe I should skip this, but if I can compress it into two minutes. The idea, as I said, divide and conquer. So solve, remember, we're trying to solve 1 plus f at 1 plus g, what is 1. Solve it, but not for all psi at once. You divide frequencies into large and small. My first construction here, which is completely standard what I'm saying, it's in every textbook, um, is to do this for large frequencies. And you, you convolve f by a bump function, l is huge. And you make it so large that in L1, this is small. Why can you do this? That's the uniform continuity of translations in L1. All right? If you use that, then this F1 has a convergence series, and therefore, on the Fourier side, you have solved this for large frequencies. For small frequencies, you no longer use uniform modulus of continuity in L1. You use that at infinity, the L1 norm vanishes. These are the two ingredients, and you will see them again. So. I will be fast here. Somewhere this has to come in. We haven't used this yet. By the way, uh, is this how Wiener proved it? Then? No, he proved it in a slightly okay. more complicated way. So for example, Komarov Volu Chandra Sekharan, right? Yeah, yeah, that is he, he was a master of this. A Tauberian theory yeah, is also really yeah. So this has to come in somewhere. What you do is you have this compact interval in terms of L, so between, what is it, minus 100 L and plus 100 L. You then partition in a very fine net, and locally near every point, you solve an equation of this type, but not on the level of the Fourier transfer, of course. You solve it on the level of L1, and then you paste it together with a partition of unity. And the construction is the solution is given by such expressions. Now, look here. this. This is an L1 guy. Chi is your favorite bump function. Its Fourier transform lives on a tiny epsilon interval. And you observe, which is completely obvious on the level of L infinity, take Fourier transform of both. You get Fourier transform, Fourier transform, the product. This amounts to uniform continuity of f hat as a continuous function. All right, so never mind these details. So you solve that. Now, what's an operator valued version of this? Look at these two conditions. You have some operators in an algebra which turns out to be maps, not L1 of bounded operators, but bounded operators into L1 valued, okay, uh, x valued L1 functions. If you have uniform continuity of translations and if you have vanishing at infinity, then you have a Wiener theorem. This is what these two gentlemen, Becciano, Becciano, Goldberg, did. And, all right? So you have. Convolution, you have Fourier transform, you have a Wiener theorem. How did they prove it? Exactly by the proof we just did, but you replace norms by these guys. More interesting is how did they apply it in the context yeah, of. What's the W? What's the W? What's the W? What's the w? Abstract. Hmm? It's defined as all bounded linear maps from X to L1 oh, RX. Okay. All right?
under this convolution it's an algebra okay and the norm is the operator norm from here to there it's not the l1 norm of the operator norm so how do yeah I know, I know I have a, it hasn't been What was your question? Sorry. Is yes. No yes, 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 yes. You, you construct this inverse. So you're asking, what is the S? The S you construct by this explicit process that you first look at large frequencies, which means large lambdas, and then the compact thing. And you do a, it becomes a finite but possibly large sum of, of such operators. Okay. And so to show you how they applied, what they did is they beat Rodniansky and me. And I'll, I'll show you how. That came as a shock to Ego and me. Ego and I, I'll show you what Ego and I had done. We had shown that if this norm is less than 4 pi, and everybody will recognize what the 4 pi is, that's the free resolvent. The free resolvent in three dimensions has this oscillatory guy and then 4 pi x minus y in the denominator. So we called this the global cutter norm. If this was small in this sense, then we wrote down an infinite Born series. We estimated the oscillatory integrals and so on. And you got the t minus 3 halves decay. And we considered it a hard problem to do this for large v. Of course, you have to project away the bound states. So you have to assume 0 and it is regular. And Becciano and Goldberg did exactly that 10 years later, roughly. Not quite 10, but. Yeah, roughly. And they did it by means of this Wiener algebra. And so they let's start with the Fourier transform. Remember, I said that the Biermann Schwinger becomes the Wiener condition. Yeah? So you start with this. And it's very neat because lambda is a scalar. So if you Fourier transform in lambda, you get a measure on a sphere. That's that. And then what is the, the L1 norm relative to x and rho, which you have to do, right? Well, it is exactly this global cutter norm that Igor and I had. And so you, with this structure, you end up with this Wiener condition, and you turn a crank, and you get the theorem. And, and right? you don't need the 4 pi. You don't need the 4 pi. But we, Igor and I could rest assured, that was already known, that there is no bound, there are no bound states, no eigenvalues under this condition, and zero energy is regular. The wave operators are not just isometries, they're unitary. So we had no, once you make this large, finite, you can have eigenvalues, in fact, infinitely many. You can have a problem at 0. And so if you assume that 0 is regular, they, then you can carry it off. they show that you still have this if v is perpendicular to the bound state. That is their theorem. And so now I will get to the meat. What is our algebra? And it's ugly, OK? Why is it ugly? Because our energy, here the energy is a scalar. In our problem, in the structure problem, the energy is actually a vector. So you get, you get something messy. And what so, you mean well, absolute lambda, root of absolute lambda squared. So lambda is a vector, strictly speaking. But you take the Euclidean length, no? Oh, actually, but I thought. No, so sorry. This, Lambda is just a scalar. It's your, yeah, this here, yeah. this here. Yeah, yeah. In our case, we will not get away with a scalar lambda. We'll have a vector valued Fourier variable. Oh, this okay. is the Wiener, Wiener algebra Fourier variable. Okay. Okay. We will not be able to implement it in this fashion at all. In fact, our algebra looks like this. Because of the following thing, because the individual terms, the Wn, remember many of you had questions about the Wn's. We only understood W1. The way we tackle Wn is we find an algebra and a star operation, a convolution, so that each of these Wn's is generated by applying this n times. And then you bound everything in the Wiener algebra, and you inherit kind of these bounds. And then you have to invert. And I'll show you quickly how to do that. But so there is a big algebra, which is fairly useless, because it's just a space of Schwartz kernels, they are tempered distributions. They are Fourier. You see, this is our energy. This is in Becciano Goldberg, lambda was a scalar. It came from the energy. Here, the Fourier variable is a vector. And your convolution is then defined by taking 
the product, which is well-defined, and taking an inverse distributional Fourier transform. And that space is much too big. That algebra is too big. It is an algebra. It's too big. Instead, you, this is a much more important creature. This is the key algebra y. It is a subalgebra of z, so that this contraction here lies in this space where x was defined on the previous slide. It's not easy to follow this, I admit. Okay? And this space, I was always a bit uncomfortable with this space, but I came to peace with it, <laughs> because you somehow have to divide by v. But that's all right. You say that Vx is controlled in some L2 decay space, yeah? L2 is with weights. And so these are the kind of algebras. And I said, without emphasizing the details here, that's impossible, that you get the higher order Ws by keeping going with this convolution. And where is our Wiener theorem? So the the key is that instead of the standard Biermann-Schwinger, we have a twisted Biermann-Schwinger. Yeah, so Bejano Goldberg just had this variable, absolute eta squared, and that's a scalar, the standard energy. We don't have that. We have to put os these oscillatory weights on either side. Amazingly, they don't affect the resolvent identity, because if you put an identity between them, they cancel out. So you can rephrase the standard resolvent identity in your algebra of operators in terms of this convolution, this non-standard convolution. And then th this is the key algebra thing. You prove invertible. This holds on the level of z, the big space. But that's useless. In order to get the structure formula, you have to prove that this is in y. So the way you do this is you show this is invertible in y. And then the inverse has to be in the smaller space. Therefore, you know that this identity has to hold simultaneously in y and in z. Okay, This is perhaps a common trick in algebra. I don't know if you have a subalgebra and you prove. Yeah. Yeah. And so what is our Wiener theorem? And then I'll stop. So the Wiener theorem is more complicated. Why, you understand, is our small algebra? You need uniform continuity of translations, but of some power. That's fine. If you have a power of this operator s, it's fine. And uniform vanishing of the y norm at infinity. That's that. But you're not done with this, because this is a complicated thing. You need to assume that the Wiener condition, this has an inverse, but you impose conditions on the inverse. Fy is the Fourier transform of the y algebra in the energy variable. That has to be uniformly bounded and uniformly continues. And then it's invertible. And these quali quant sorry, qualitative properties, remember I had a quantitative version of a main theorem. You can make that quantitative. All right? You don't just say uniformly continuous. You have some Hölder modulus uniformly. And with that, you then can quantify all of this. All right? And Tom, your question at the end was about s x minus 2, scaling yeah, yeah, invariant. Yeah, yeah. So we have, from this year, and we're still working on extensions of this, there exists a scale. B1 half would be exactly x minus 2. The dot is, you understand, it's like base of dot. Yeah. There is some magic B norm. I can flash the slide in a moment. So if you have smallness, then you have the structure theorem. Notice there is no assumption on zero energy, because under smallness, you don't have a problem. You sum the infinite Dyson series. But you still have to do a Wiener algebra, because you don't derive structure formulas for each of the Wn's. You derive them for the first one. And then you use the algebra structure to pass that information on without having to derive explicitly Gn's. Yeah? It's just G1, the first structure function. And unfortunately, our it looks kind of clean, but from V you build L. The L function, remember? <laughs> you build this L function, and then you have to slice along planes. And you put this norm we did see, the L1t omega. And so that's our crazy scaling invariant norm that is dictated by the technique. And it is closely related to such a creature where you, have, you lose half a derivative on two-dimensional planes. 
far away from just imposing an x minus 2 decay condition. There is some regularity condition, okay, at least for high frequencies. Um, okay, so it's an ongoing story. Thank you.